Hey guys, welcome to today I'm uh, Sadhan from On Behalf of Design Hub, and today we are in a new session with one and only Lime Martin to discuss the tips and tricks to grow your business remotely, and of course your team along with it. And uh, in today's session, we could have no other better than actually Lime. He is the pioneer in this field, a master's degree holder from University of uh, uh, University of McGill, if I'm not wrong, Lime. Correct. And then. Uh, Then the founder of uh, Stab dot com and of course Stan Doctor dot com, a visionary in his field, and today he will answer you the questions that in this pandemic or in any other environment as well, how can you on your maximum profit game using uh, remote working? So before we start, I would like to give us more introduction about what is Design Hill. So Design Hill is the world's leading uh, it it is the world maybe the world's leading creative marketplace. So where we are helping businesses of all sizes. To get the creative requirements done, so we have a presence of over in one over in over 180 countries with a community of more than one point one point uh, around point one eight million designers as well. So that's we are. So so now, how do you feel to be here now? I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, it's very kind of rainy outside, but I'm feeling very excited to be here with you guys and. Hopefully, we can answer a couple of questions about what's currently happening with the pandemic, and then how I think the economy is really changing towards remote, which is、uh, one of the silver linings of this entire mess. Ah,、uh, ah.、Uh, so, Liam, first things first. That actu-、uh, what actually inspired you to, you know, take this、uh, topic or take this problem and、uh, make having a product out of it. What inspired you on, on the first place? Sure. So. I actually had a previous business, which was a time tracking company, or sorry, a current business is time tracking company. Previous business was an online tutoring company, and the problem that I had is I had all of these online tutors, and it was very difficult for me to be able to measure exactly how long a student and tutor worked together. So, as an example, I would have a Student come to me and say, "Well, I didn't actually work with my tutor for ten hours. I worked with him for six hours." And then I'd have to go to the tutor and say, "Did you work with Jimmy for ten hours?" And the tutor would say, "Of course, that's what I billed for." So I'd end up having to refund the student and then pay the tutor the full amount, and that was destroying the business. So I realized that a tool like Time Doctor was really the solution that I was looking for that wasn't currently in the market. And、um, nine years later, here we are. So I'll say,、uh, what we can say is、uh, the solution to one of your startups' problem is now providing solutions to the workplaces around the world now. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean,、yeah. we've seen huge growth.、Uh, obviously, everyone that's in the remote work tool space has seen massive growth, and、um, I think it's one of those things that we've been. Realistically, now we were very early in comparison to. What's currently happening, but the space has probably accelerated five to six years in two to three months. So it's very exciting what's currently happening in the space, and I think for anyone that's listening right now, getting into the remote workspace is probably going to be a business model that's going to be significantly expanding over the next at least few years. Definitely, we can actually see that because even the conventional businesses, for example, education and everything, they have started migrating very strongly towards it now. So yeah, they, that's a good change、yeah. actually.、Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And、uh, let us say if、uh, there's there's an organization who is actually very much new to this culture, they are very much used to the fact that people will come to your office, they will perform a certain certain set、uh, set of tasks, and they will go home. And they want to have this cultural migration. So, how should they go about it? Because there is a huge scope of conflict over there.、Mm-hmm. From, from well, strictly think, brick and mortar to online space. Yeah. So, I think the two biggest problems that end up occurring inside of remote companies that are trying to make the transition from on-premise, what we call basically in-office, or called on-premise, to remote first, is communication and.、Um, Process documentation. So the communication part first. Communication just doesn't automatic automatically happen inside of remote teams. There is no "Can I have a minutes?" inside of remote teams. It's very much focused on、um, trying to schedule that time in that space. So 
you need to be able to make sure that you're communicating with your team, that you're setting up purposeful times to meet, that you're following up on KPIs and metrics. We use a tool called Fellow for that, uh, which is really powerful. And then you are moving forward. So you're reporting in on that data and you're doing like a team meeting and on one on one with every single person inside of your team every single week. That's what we personally do. Uh, now, the other part of the calculation is SOPs or process documentation. There's a couple tools out on the market that you can use for this, but fundamentally what that means is you need to take all of the information that you have about how you run your business and you need to be able to write it down, basically document it. You need to digitize it, meaning you need to put it into a cloud platform that everyone can get access to that information and then you need to just be able to distribute that. So everyone in the company, as an example, knows how to do everything else inside of the company. So I can, um, if you worked for Time Doctor, as an example, you would know how to do marketing, you would know how to do uh, development, or you would at least have all of the playbooks and process documents to be able to do that. Perfect example being the current situation that we are in, Assuming 20% of your team may be sick at any one point, it's really important to have those types of redundancies in place. So inside of Time Doctor, everyone in the company knows how to do customer support because we just trained everyone on it when we knew this pandemic was coming up so that if the support team is sick, we can very quickly jump in and, um, and have a rep basically or have a marketing person or a customer success person turn into a support person very quickly and easily. You can't do that without proper SOPs. Uh, in terms of tools, Google Docs is basically quick and easy and cheap. Um, if you want to go one step up, I would suggest you check out GitLab. They have a really good platform for building out SOPs and they actually have the largest open source uh, remote first process document on the planet, which is at about.gitlab.com slash handbook. And then the third one, if you want to go for a paid option, is a tool that we like called Trail. Uh, and between those three tools, you should be able to figure out where you want to go in terms of SOPs. Put something up there and just kind of start. Every time you feel like someone's asked you a question more than three times about a particular thing, turn it into a process document and put it up on that platform. So fundamentally, what are you doing is you are actually anticipating the needs very on a very run real time basis and then making the solutions out of them. Correct. Yes. So, in the, in the yeah, it's it's so important to be able to make sure that you're you're doing this on the fly as well. So inside of our company, as an example, if there's a process document that needs to change, we will generally reward people monetarily, we'll give them a bonus for every process document that they can change that's accepted as the new gold standard for that particular process. So the system basically evolves organically because process documents really do need to evolve. But once something is a process, then it's kind of considered like a rule of the company. So you can't do it any other way other than that way, unless you change the process. And um, and then we reward you, obviously, for changing that process. So once you get that type of thing pumping, then it's kind of magical because you'll see this process document just expand and, um, and evolve into ways that you didn't even think were possible. So uh, let, let us say, let us move beyond the technical aspect of this. Uh, let, let us say I'm an employee uh, or maybe an employer per se, and I'm suddenly moving to this atmosphere where I am moving beyond my office to my home right now. So there is mm -hmm. certain sort of mental preparation that, that I would need actually. That mm, no, just in no terms of you personally as an employee? Yeah. Or sorry, like a, as, a, as a business owner like an, and or an employee, what do you need? Well, yeah. there's a ton of stuff that you should really look at. Like we're, you know, you can probably see me on, on camera right now. I have one of these which is an external monitor. I suggest everyone pick up an external monitor. This one was, I believe, 300 and something dollars Canadian. It's a 32 inch monitor. It doesn't have the highest, um, you know, it's not 4K, I think it's like 1K or something or 1080, but it has a USB-C plug that connects to my laptop. So at any point I can just basically pop into my laptop and have that external screen. Uh, buy a really good mouse. 
This is the MX3 Master. It is the best mouse on the market. Now, when I first, someone had convinced me to basically buy a mouse and uh, I said, are you crazy? I want to, you know, I have a, a trackpad on my laptop. I don't want to have a, an extra thing, particularly because I travel quite a bit. Absolute best investment you could ever make. Um, these are amazing. These are the Bose SoundTrue Ultras. They're about $70 on Amazon. The reason why I like them is they don't only have a very comfortable um, fit into my ear, but more importantly, they have a very, very good microphone, which you're listening to right now. So you need to be able to figure out not just who has the best audio quality, but who has the best mic quality. Um, the other thing that you know kind of pops up for me is get a really comfortable chair. I'm sitting on a chair that I find uh, very comfortable. The test that you should be doing is if you can sit in the chair and you don't need to adjust your body for one minute, then that's the chair for you. So just go into a chair store and just start sitting in chairs and you'll be surprised at the thousand dollar chair that maybe you're kind of really wriggling around in and isn't very comfortable for you and the $25 chair, which is perfect for you. So it really depends on your body and you have to figure that out. Outside of that, I mean, you know, just deploying technology tools. So we use tools like Slack, we use tools like Zoom, Skype, um, Basecamp, Trello for project management. These are all tools that you really need to just kind of get up and running. And I mean, we can go into that into a little bit more detail, but fundamentally, it just means how can you communicate effectively remotely? And then how can you measure metrics effectively inside of a remote team? Those are the two critical things that you need to do. So build your technology stack to kind of focus on that. Again, that actually, that actually makes sense. And first things first, I would actually change my chair after that because now you put that in my mind. So Good yeah. idea. Uh, that can be scenario you now. Uh, let us say uh, if there's some, there is a company just starting from the very much, uh, let's say they want to start from the remote, remote working basis only. So how, what are the, like, the right hiring strategies to hire a remote team? Because there, there are a lot of factors to incorporate, uh, starting from the zone you're working in. Maybe the country sure. you're working in right now, you have a, the bandwidth is not that high, which, which mm -hmm. should be a for your work. But the person is really good. So how do you incorporate all these factors in and build a perfect team or, a, or a, what we can say a close to perfect team, a very efficient team? Mm. Well, so I think the biggest thing with regards to hiring people remotely is, first of all, you want to make sure that they are interested in hiring remotely. So we currently now do a culture test before we even look at whether or not someone is qualified. So we'll find out. Are they interested in working remotely? Are they interested? Are they really passionate about that particular subject? Because if they're not, our goal, our mission statement as a company is we want to empower people to work wherever they want, whenever they want. So if you're not aligned to that goal, then we probably shouldn't be working together, regardless of whatever your resume looks like. Just in terms of platforms, I mean, you know, we've, we've mentioned Design Hill, obviously, but if you go to any of the other platforms, um, Upwork, TopTow, Remote OK, We Work Remotely, Flex Jobs, 99 Designs, Dribble, all of these platforms, you know, you can find those types of positions uh, if you really need it. And then the last one that I would really touch on is just make sure that you're focused on making sure that the um, that the hiring procedures that you're going through apply to a remote model. So as an example, inside of our company, we usually end up working with people for one to three months before we hire them on full time. And the reason why we do that is because we can afford to do it inside of a remote work model. So let's say that I was hiring someone in Mumbai, as an example, we would go on a one to three month contract before we really bring that person on full time, because it's so fast and easy to be able to hire. On average, a remote worker is hired 35% faster than an on-premise employee just because of the capabilities of moving so much faster um, on a remote model versus an in-person model. So take that into consideration and you can test people for longer and faster with the remote model, which ends up getting you better candidates down the line. So fundamentally, where I see it, that you are actually going to the very basics of work. You are making person you are hiring the persons who are actually passionate about their job. They're just working for any job. They're polishing their craft. And in a way, we can yeah, say... I mean, if, you're, if, if you don't like your job, then you don't want to hire those people. 
that that will be <laughs> that will end up not being a very good uh, business, right? Like the the core piece, particularly for a business owner, your only responsibility is to hire the right people. That is like that is rule one, two, and three of building a successful business. If they are not aligned to your goals then you need to recognize that as quickly as possible and get them off the bus or even better, never hire them in the first place. And I'm blown away at how many people don't really follow that rule where they just say, oh, well, their resume is so great. It doesn't work. I'm telling you, it is, we've tried that, we've tried it repeatedly, and it always ends up blowing, in our, blowing up in our face because if someone is really not aligned to the company mission, then eventually, particularly when time gets tough, times get tough, they will not be there for you. So definitely, because you know, there are, it's a traditional view that you actually see the uh, the coherence between the skill set and the job description. But what you're bringing in is the passion for the work. So it may sound a little fancy sometimes, or maybe a little too hypothetical, a little too fairy tale. But that that's actually the that that's that's how few people should work. Actually, we should choose the job they love. So you, you are in a way changing the dynamics as well of how people actually should work and, and the, on the first principle level, how they should be mm -hmm. hired even. You're changing, you are like disrupting the entire dynamics of a remote uh, remote working or hiring or maybe cultural integration as well. You, well, I mean, I think hiring remotely is beautiful because you can basically prove whether or not their CVs are real very quickly, like way faster and way more cost effective than you could before. So let's say you want to hire a designer. Um, and maybe a designer is a bad example because, well, actually, no, it couldn't be. So let's say I apply as a designer and I just steal a whole bunch of designs from an amazing group of designers. And I say, this is my portfolio. How do you know that I didn't steal that content? You don't until you actually hire me, right? Until you do some testing. And maybe I can even get by with a little bit of testing, particularly if I'm working remotely, right? If I have a, a remote team um, at my beck and call and maybe I hire a really good designer to be able to build out logos for me as an example, well, um, maybe I could make it in as a full-time designer. And you wouldn't really figure this out until three, six months into the process. But with remote work, you can hire that person, hire them on full-time, and really check to see whether or not their CD aligns with um, their resume aligns with with what they're saying and what they're qualified to do. So we've just realized that 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 process is way cheaper, and just people don't really do that because they're thinking about the old school model of look at someone's resume, do to three to four interviews, and then just take a chance that they're qualified and hire them on full time. You don't need to do that. There can be an in between step. That's all I'm saying. Uh, and Lam, let us say if there is a structure which requires a hybrid team model, some of them are required to be uh, on premises, some, some of them are required to be off premises. Then how mm -hmm. does uh, we should build? How should we adapt to that culture? So that's an interesting question. I think that there are some there are some problems inside of that model. Um, we've when we've been looking at remote teams versus on premise teams and the hybrid model, there is what's called second class citizens or second class employees inside of organizations and then founder islands. So second class employees are employees that are not located in the main area where the main office is, is located. So let's say that your, your main office is located in Mumbai and let's say that you are in um, Bali as an example, you'd be a class, second class employee because you would very rarely be making the trips to Mumbai to be able to work with that uh, that company or that office. So you get less access to decision makers. You get less, less access to just sort of nonverbal culture that connects to that organization. So that's one problem. The second problem that we've discovered is founder islands inside of remote teams. So um, Amir, who is the CEO of Todoist, which is a fantastic task management app, is also a good friend of mine, and we uh, we both go to Running Remote every single year, which is the conference that we run on building and scaling remote teams. Amir recognized that when he moved to Barcelona, some of his employees started moving to Barcelona with him. 
um, because they wanted more access to that decision maker. So that founder now has a small group of people that end up kind of coming to that area and you need to be able to fight that as much as possible. So biggest concern in a hybrid model is make sure that that employee that's not on site is treated to this with the same level of respect as an employee that is on site. An example of that is when we do a phone call or a video call with everyone, let's say there's four people inside of the same room, we will all be on separate computers with our, our, um, our videos on, like our webcams on. We won't all be in the same space or we won't all show up on the same camera or the singular computer. Reason being is we wanna be able to create the perspective that everyone is equal. And also as a founder, you need to be very resistant towards just sort of making a decision based uh, without conferring with the remote person if you're in front of person, uh, someone that's you know just asking you for something right off the bat. Hopefully that makes sense. Of course, that is uh, that's actually a very valuable point. You know, it sounds very basic that you have to treat employees in equal respect, but you know, there's an old, there is a very old adage which says, uh, "Out of sight, out of mind." So that is actually happens yes. in corporate sector as well. It happens because someone who is far away, we don't really seek them uh, for advices when it comes to making decisions. So that's mm -hmm. uh, that can something uh, bothersome. And Lime, uh, let's move to a few questions as well. I can see a question, some few questions popping up right now. So sure. we can take off here. So let's say we will take the questions by Catherine right now. So how your team can adapt to a new way of working remotely? So that, you know, the adjustment phase, the transition yeah. phase actually. So some so of that phase. I think that if you're, you know, if you're in the state of what we're currently calling suddenly remote, it's very important to be able to make sure that you're moving quick and you're laying the right ground rules from the very beginning. So, and everyone's actually moved quick to be actually honest with you. This is probably, this is advice I would give someone maybe six months back, but today everyone's actually moved quick. So they're in this situation where they've currently already been working remotely maybe a month, month and a half. And the next thing that you need to be able to do is set up the ground rules. So what are your current expectations in terms of productivity? How long should people be working? What should they be doing while they're working? Um, you know, what kind of metrics do they need to be reporting in on? So as an example, inside of our company, every single person is responsible for a particular quantitative metric. And that is reported every week, not every two weeks, not every month, not every quarter, every single week. And then what I do is I say, are you on target or, or are you off target? If you're off target, then I spend a lot more time with you to be able to hopefully get you on target. And if you're on target, then I generally just leave you alone. <laughs> uh, and so many times inside of on-premise teams, that's not incredibly clear and and or it's just not reported in the same way because the communication happens almost kind of like non-verbally where you'll be sitting around the coffee machine and you'll just say oh how's that project going and you'll say it's going great that's not what you want uh, you want to be able to record that information very very clearly and you want to be able to make sure that you can make course corrections as quickly as possible. So if you're moving off course on, let's say, the first month of your quarter, and you've already reported in four times, you can save that and arc it back up by making a change. But if you're only reporting every month or every two weeks, then it's a lot more difficult to be able to make that change. That's a, a really critical piece of that. And then, you know, outside of just adapting, once you've got all those pieces in place, as I had said before, build process documentation, go to about.gitlab.com slash handbook. It's a 3200 page remote work document. It's the largest open source document on planet Earth. GitLab's a pretty good company. They got a $3 billion valuation. They know what they're doing when it comes to remote teams and steal everything in there. Dimitri, who is the co-founder and CTO of GitLab, has stated very clearly, you can steal it. You can literally just fork that repo and then you will be running your own deployment of their process document and just pull out the stuff that you need and you're up and running. Well, that's a massive open source document actually. And so we have a next question by Brian Aki. 
So I will try to just modify the question a little bit as well because I believe that uh, there's a lot of scope in this question in terms of what people can actually take it uh, take out of it. What can employers sure. do to make sure that people are staying focused, committed, and happy? So I guess she's what she's trying to do is uh, she's trying to factor the emotional quotient in this right now. The sure. happiness question of employees. So how do we, you know, actually we cannot quantify it because maybe we can in near future, but right actually. Now, you oh, can oh, right. you can do it. Let me show you how I do it. Uh, I don't have it in front of me right now, but I have a. Um, so this is my my journal that I use for running remote, which is the other project that we use, which is um, a, a, a conference on building and scaling remote teams. We run it out of Bali. This is acacia wood from Ubud, Bali, and inside of this book, uh, I will usually write down the date, and then I'll I'll measure how happy I am out of five. So I say, I'm having a really bad day, I'm a one, or I'm having a, a fantastic day, I'm having a four or a five. And I measure that every single day. And it's really important for mental health to be able to record that on a longitudinal scale, because the, and this is coming back from my days as a sociologist and psychologist, mental health doesn't just happen or not happen. It's a very slow process. So you, might have a shock like what we're currently going through right now and if you don't rebound from that shock you could end up going further and further into basically chemical depression and once you're in a state of chemical depression it takes approximately six months quite a bit of professional therapy and usually some type of medication in order for you to get back up into that curve in which you, you've got positive feedback loops. Um, and when you talk about medical depression, it's just literally the cortisol, the stress that's running through your body, you adapt to a new level of normal, which is never a good thing. So by recognizing it very early, you can create that early warning system and then have someone that you can hopefully reach out to. So is that your manager? Is that your, you know, the owner of the business? Is that a therapist? Is that some type of professional that can help you with mental health? Get that help as quickly as possible because then you can arc back up into a uh, positive side of the equation. Really important right now uh, to be able to basically keep people happy. Now, the focused and committed side, that's where we talk about metrics. So you can deploy a tool like Time Doctor, which again, I'm quite biased with, but we use it every single day inside of our company to be able to measure exactly what's being done. Report on that data, submit it into the organization so that you are getting that feedback loop and you know exactly what's happening on at least a weekly basis. So your company, can move forward and more importantly your manager can start to detect whether or not you are having any type of negative feedback connected to that mental state because your mental state definitely suggests as to your capabilities to execute from a business perspective um, they're almost intrinsically linked so again stay mentally solid create that early warning system and then after that, make sure that you're reporting in so that um, you can you can get help if and it ends up being you know a bigger issue. So if I have to summarize it, we can uh, simply assume that we need to have some quantifiable metric which we can we can actually either measure mental health or maybe give a reference to it. And if we can observe the data and have some benchmarks regarding the same, and if we see mm -hmm. uh, if we see a slight dip in that then we can also we can always have some contingency plans ready or maybe some measures which you, uh, mm -hmm. which you can implement right away yep because sometimes no, uh, it's uh, it's actually very difficult to judge someone's mental health when we don't uh, have that you know physical proximity sometimes because sometimes you can mm -hmm. see someone lagging around and we can't on a, we can't we can't actually see them on a remote level that's a way to go about it so mm -hmm. yeah yep. uh, so that's going actually really well. And uh, Liam, I think uh, we are actually past half an hour for the time actually flew. So what we can do is we can have a quick uh, break of three to, four, three to five minutes, and then we will convene back. OK. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Yeah, so I mean, and or anything else that you guys want me to do. I'm here. Yeah.
<laughs> of course. So we will, we will have a quick Looking break to get your we'll boss to remember your name? Head to the world's number one creative marketplace, Design Hill. When my company promoted me to head up our latest real estate development project, I was excited, then anxious, then petrified. How was I going to hire the team, get the designs completed, and design beautiful presentation materials on our lean budget while impressing my bosses, some of whom are still learning my name? Good job, Mitch. My name's Lawrence. That's why I went to Design Hill and got the design help I needed that fit within my company's brand guidelines. The process was simple. Design Hill's design contest ensured I'd get a ton of results I'd love. Start by picking a number of designs that inspire you. This one's good, and that one. This one speaks to me. Then share some information about the project. Lastly, pick a package that fits your budget. Do you just want a logo, or do you want it all? Then, boom. I got more than 60 custom design options to choose from, as well as all the other graphic design assets I wanted. And it's all backed by Design Hill's 100% money back guarantee. If I don't find a design I like, I get my money back. You can't lose. Now I have what I need to make a splash of my meetings. With everything from business cards, pamphlets, posters, and more. It's real. Let the world know it's real and build your brand with Design Hill. Need to get your parents off your back? Head to the world's number one creative marketplace, Design Hill. When I started my photography business, I needed something that said, this was more than just a hobby. It's not a hobby, mom. That's why I went to Design Hill and got an amazing logo, super fast, at a price I could afford. The process was easy using Design Hill's logo maker. Just enter the name of your business, then pick out a number of designs that inspire you. I'll pick this one and that, that one looks cute. Then pick your colors or let the system decide. Add some more info like a slogan, the industry your business is in, and your budget. The logo maker, using machine learning and artificial intelligence, will design thousands of logo variants that you can choose from and adapt. In fact, I was able to get everything from business cards to t-shirt design and complete social media kit, all with the click of a button. With that, I'm all set. Now everyone I meet knows I'm a legit photographer. Even my mom. It's real. That's decaf. Let the world know it's real and build your brand with Design Hill. So guys, uh, we are back here right now, and uh, I hope you are enjoying the session right now. And and we have Lion with us. I'm here. Oh, so, yeah. So Lion, we are good to. It's good to have you back. And uh, let's uh, move on to the next question. And we are having a slight difficulty with Lion's bandwidth right now, so have to stay put. I hope you can hear him fine. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you fine. So okay. I would like to ask the audience. So guys, if you can hear us fine, just can you drop a small yes or a hi or something in the chat box? Please drop a small hi if you can hear us. OK. So I guess uh, we are going to go. Thank you, Rashmi. And uh, so now I guess uh, let's move to the next question. OK. Yeah. And uh, let us say a very genuine question, maybe by the Boomer workforce: uh, How to deal with the online distraction in workplace, given that you're working remotely? Sure. So, be challenged. Uh, two two major methods that you can use to be able to do that. The first one is you can deploy a tool like Time Doctor, which if you start to get distracted, it can actually say, "Hey, you're just about to, you know, you're on Netflix." you probably shouldn't be on Netflix. Do you want to um, go back to answering emails as an example? So we created that as like a direct feedback loop inside of Time Doctor so that if you want to be able to go to Netflix, you can just say, yeah, no, I want to go to Netflix and then forget about it. And you're just going to use Netflix um, for however long you want to do it or Candy Crush or whatever the heck else you want to play. Um, I love Candy Crush. Uh, 
So you can do that. And then the second part of distracting uh, of distraction is just creating a sacred space for work. So I thankfully have an office that I can work out of, and I'm very lucky to be able to have that. But even if it's just a place on your couch or just a, a seat on a desk or at your kitchen table, it's important to be able to create a space where you only do work and you do nothing else. So as an example, if I were to um, decide to play on my iPad, which I have right next to me, I would literally get up from this space, I would go outside and I would go on to social media outside of this office. So I create a very sacred space here that's only focused on work. And that's been incredibly powerful for you. I know it sounds, or for me, I know it sounds a little weird, but it really, really works if you're disciplined with it. And it'll probably take you about 30 days before you turn that into a, um, a discipline. And after that, you're, you're gonna be just fine in terms of your overall productivity. And Lam, I would also like you to touch on the point that how good uh, remote working or save and time doctor can be for freelancers who work independently. Sure. We just want to track their, we just want to track their efficiency. So, do yep. the the time doctor offers enough scope for them, or maybe remote working solutions? Yeah. So, I mean, money is time, particularly if you're a freelancer or you're an agency. So you. And it quite literally is time because let's say you're billing someone out on an hourly basis, you need to be able to measure that and then you need to be able to provide that documentation to your client. So Time Doctor does that beautifully. Um, a lot of users use it personally for their own personal productivity. So they will measure all of the different data metrics that connect to their workday and then try to figure out how to become a lot more productive um, with it. So, you know, we definitely have a huge user base, thousands and thousands of users that just use it individually for that. And um, it is, it's probably, I mean, it's the way that I use it. Uh, so no one, I don't have to report my numbers to anybody, but I do report my numbers to the rest of the company. So everyone inside of the company uses Time Doctor, even me, and anyone inside of the organization can basically go and see exactly what I'm doing right now. Like I'm doing webinar with Design Hill as my task, and everyone knows that I'm currently working on that today. Uh, and it creates a really good feedback loop where everyone knows that um, you're on track. Uh, that, uh, that's, that's something which we'd like to answer the question off of uh, this time, Mr. Albert. And uh, land, let's say there are, there are a few industries which cannot be, by the very nature of existence, they can be defined in numbers, let's say. Uh, for example, let's say we are, in a, uh, we are an advertising agency. And the mm -hmm. measurement of an advertising agency's output is the number of creative ideas, the number of brainstorming sessions we have, the number of maybe coffee cups and pizza we threw around. So how do we actually, you know, get that, uh, those variables, yeah. those... It's a yeah, difficult it's measure. Um, you're absolutely right. So if I was an advertising agency, and let's just say I'm doing an online, like I'm doing the ad creatives that Design Hill has, which are amazing. Um, how do I measure the output on that? Well, I really look at where money is involved. So probably if I was looking at those ad creatives, I would say, let's say there's three to four different versions of that that two employees have made. I would look at time on site. So how long did someone consume that piece of content? What actions did they take afterwards? Did they click through and did they actually sign up for Design Hill or did they not? And then uh, what's the long-term monetization of that particular customer? Did that customer come in and buy $5 worth of services or did that customer come in and buy $500 worth of services? And the beauty of having an online business is that you can do all of these things. So even though the feedback loop is going to be quite long, uh, you'd very quickly be able to figure out who is successful and who is unsuccessful inside of this model. We do this as an example, a time doctor, everything that we measure is quantified. So um, if we can't quantify it, we, we generally don't do it. And a lot of these things are maybe a little bit more complicated so developers, as an example, very, very complicated to be able to measure the overall productivity of a developer. But the metric that we've come up with, which we think is the best, is net new lines of code. So how many codes, how many lines of code did you write and how many codes of line, 
lines of code did you delete? And then what are your net new lines of code per day, as an example? Uh, and then a secondary factor that we work into is how short is your software? So how many lines of code did you need to write to accomplish the particular task? Again, we're getting a little too nerdy into this, but we found that those are the best two measures to be able to figure out, is someone writing good code that's edited properly and documented properly? And then also, is it efficient code? Is it something that um, someone can do in 30 lines of code, which maybe requires more thought, versus doing it in 300 lines of code, but doing it a lot more messy and getting the same result? So yeah, you... Uh... That's, uh, I'm actually pretty much blown away by the coding part that we're actually factoring in a thought process as well because just for the sake of it, if you know, just to show that I'm busy, I might, might end up writing a, a whole bunch of codes actually. But then most developers work. get rid of them yeah. as quickly as possible. The, the, the more inefficient your code is, the, the worse the software will be. And when you refactor, you're going to have to redo that very, very quickly. Um, Again, I don't want to get too nerdy here because we're talking about design people, but like that, like running an efficient software stack and software in general is the result that you want. So you just work back from that result. And then how can you quantify that type of result? That's basically how you measure this. Uh, you can afford to be nerdy right now because the moment you give that idea that how can you measure a designer's productivity, maybe a creative, there is a, there is a creative out there. And people did people actually click for the creative or did it that, or whether that creative cause any sign ups or anything. So mm -hmm. you are actually correlating uh, the creative potential by its conversion potential. So that's something which I which and, well, and that's what we want, right? What's yeah. the what's the point of building a logo? It's to get someone to understand what your product is about and then get them to buy your product. That's the only reason why we're building these design assets. So work backwards from that, right? And then try to figure out where you can come up with a quantifiable measure. And you can't do it perfectly, obviously. If you're a call center rep, I can very easily measure your overall productivity. How many dials are you doing per hour? And then how many of those dials resulted in the needed, in the goal that I've set for you? You can very, very quickly and easily do that. With designers, it's a little bit more difficult, obviously. With developers, it's even more difficult. But there are those measures there. And to suggest that they are not there would suggest that we're doing this all by chance, which um, if you're doing this all by chance, you're probably not going to have a very successful business long term. Yeah, remote working is like a stimulant for any, uh, every business owner. That Let's get to numbers now. There is always right. a way to quantify Absolutely. things, and find, yeah, there is always a way to quantify things, and maybe sooner or later you will sooner or later you will arrive on the correct metrics. So we should start doing it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know uh, there is a question by Alice over here. But do you mm -hmm. shift? Uh, do you see this crisis changing the way all teams and organizations operating going forward? So maybe she is hinting to a a real permanent change now. Because some yes. things that companies actually have realized that they can work really well remotely. So is there a, is there a so, permanent shift underway? Yeah. Um, I don't know whether or not Alice is still on here, but it would be great to kind of get a, ask her to, to clarify exactly what she's looking at. I can go off on a crazy rant <laughs> with regards to where we're currently at um, in terms of this crisis. Uh, we have seen the largest shift of labor in the history of human civilization occur in the last two months. It has absolutely been the biggest shift in the way that we work since, I mean, more than the internet, um, because we've literally moved billions and billions of people from where they were in an office to now at home in months. And we've been talking to clients that have moved their entire organizations to a remote first model in hours. It is a massive shift. Just to kind of give you some numbers, 2018 in the United States, 4% of the US workforce was working full-time remotely, meaning basically more than four days per week. That number now by our estimates is 70%. So we've had a massive, massive shift. And I'm assuming it's probably the same ratio everywhere 
else. So this is going to be a complete game changer in terms of understanding how we do work, how we interact with work. After the, these, this crisis is over, uh, I see a few huge shifts that are going to occur. Office leases, if you are running, if you are in um, basically commercial real estate, you're in deep, deep trouble. Get out of commercial real estate as quickly as possible. I'm assuming between 22% and 75% of all offices will basically shut down their leases within the next 12 months. So you need to get out of that. And I don't think those will be coming back. Um, Airline industry will be coming back, but nowhere near the levels that it was beforehand because they've now discovered definitively that a Zoom call 19 times out of 20 is way more cost effective and has the same result as a flight on business class from New York to Los Angeles, which costs you $3,000. Um, the general space is going to be moving remote, even though places like co-working spaces no longer are really a viable business model right now, within the next two to three years, co-working spaces will probably 10x in terms of a business. And then also, lastly, uh, remote work tools. I would probably say conservatively, I've seen remote work tools doubling to 20xing within the last few months. And that trajectory is obviously going to veer off over the next year or two. But I would say there's still... Um, I would say the remote workspace was like a billion dollar space before this started, and it's a trillion dollar space right now. So there's a massive vacuum right now, and anyone that's thinking about getting into this should get into it as quickly as humanly possible because there's tons of dollars to be made. Rant over. Yeah, of course. So is this, is this a hint for the real estate guys that they might shift their gears and move into product industry now? Yeah, you, you need to get out of um, you need to get out of office leases. It, it's like commercial real estate is going to permanently change. Uh, I don't think it's not going to exist, but I would say conservatively. So we pulled uh, people at the Running Remote Conference, which is the conference that we run, and we asked people who were newly remote how many of those people were planning on getting rid of their office leases. And within the first month of everyone being in this situation, 22% of people polled said that they're getting rid of their office leases right now. That's month one. Um, what's going to be happening when we're doing this for six months? What's going to be happening when we're doing this, unfortunately, for probably 12 months? There is going to be a massive, massive shift. I think 22% is going to be the low end of that estimate. So, you know, if you want your, let's assume 50%. No commercial leaseholder can survive with 50% of their dis, uh, their business disappearing. It just doesn't make sense. You know, uh, one way I can say is maybe half past this century, uh, we can actually say very convincingly that this uh, shift maybe the can be the biggest uh, the biggest shift in human workforce in human workforce uh, uh, alignment History. to the culture. Yeah, and as compared to even industrial revolution as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. actually going on those lines. The impact is that huge. You know, I, and I think there's going to be a lot of really positive moves as well. Uh, I think within the next two years, there will be in, in inside of remote work, you can't talk about remote work without mentioning digital nomadism, which is yeah. location independent individuals that work from their laptops and they just travel the world. We do have some passport barriers to be able to get through. So, I'm Canadian. I can travel anywhere in the world. Usually, I just get a passport on arrival. I know that all countries can't do that, um, unfortunately. But I think that that will expand, and I could bet you that location-independent work will 10 to 20x within two to three years. So that'll be huge. Uh, I think that, ironically, real estate in the countryside, in small villages, in rural areas, will go through the roof because people will now recognize I can buy um, a million dollar home in the countryside and I can buy an eight bedroom, you know, five bathroom plus for the cost of a one bedroom place in a major metropolitan area. So that's gonna completely shift because now I don't need to commute to work. The commute is basically zero, so why would I live in such a, a small space when I can get a much larger space 
for in essence the same amount of money. I mean, there, there's tons of things that are that are going to happen from this. There's tons of implications, but I mean, those are just a few off the top of my head. And if you choose any of those directions, there is a business model inside of everything that I've said that's probably a billion dollar model uh, right now. So yeah, there is an industrial change. Then there is a workplace change. Then, then is a then there is a lifestyle change as well. So mm -hmm. we have a, a three pronged results results now. So uh, yeah. So now let's move to a little bit a more human part of it. Let's say live. So can you give me like top five tips how to conduct a very effective virtual meetings? Sure. Uh, so yeah. just off the top of my head, in terms of virtual meetings, um, make sure that they're scheduled. Number one, who needs to be on the meeting and who does not need to be on the meeting. Meetings are very expensive. I'm constantly surprised that there are people inside of the organization that can't requisition a paperclip, but they could put 10 people in a room for two hours, count up how much they're worth, and you're wasting a ton of money. So we have a, a rule inside of Time Doctor, which is if the, if the meeting is not important to you, you can leave at any point and you don't, you're not going to get reprimanded for leaving. You're going to get back to your regular job. So schedule it, make sure the right people are in place. Uh, make sure that you have a very clear process to your meetings. So we usually go through what are our top wins? Um, what are some of our customer headlines that we want to update everyone for the week? What are some blockers that everyone has inside of um, their particular work lives? We report on metrics and we go through all of them, like I was saying before. And then we figure out what we're going to be doing next week. So outside of those, I mean, that's a general process. That meeting usually takes about 45 minutes to at the max an hour and a half. If it's longer than an hour and a half, you really haven't been efficient with your time. Uh, also, never do a meeting with more than seven people. This is a sociological rule, which I'm constantly surprised that people don't follow this. If you're in a party, when we can actually go to parties after this whole pandemic thing is over, if you watch a group of seven people at a party and then you see one more person enter that group of seven people, every single time they will divide up into two groups. It's really magical. So uh, never have more than eight direct reports. Never do a meeting with more than eight people. It's an inefficient use of your time. Make them under 90 minutes. Make sure that you have very clear metrics so that everyone knows exactly what's happening. And then um, just in terms of technology, use Skype or Zoom. So if you want to go for free, uh, Skype is a really great free option. And if you want to have a paid option, go for Zoom. It has the ability to be able to record calls, um, make really cool backgrounds, just a bunch of other features. But it does cost money to be able to do that. And you can do large AMAs. So you can do, uh, we usually do our company AMA on Zoom every single month. And uh, that's with everyone inside of the company. And it's, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. And you just don't, you couldn't do that on Skype in the same way. So yeah, that actually is something which is everything can take away because some hacks like you, you never do a meeting with over seven people. We actually don't think on those lines. We can have like massive town halls discussing critical issues, but they can, do, do not yield to seek any concrete result. They're actually a, a transactional in nature. So guys, we can actually mm -hmm. have a lot of tips over here and yep. uh, yeah, and uh, we have uh, we, can, we can take at least uh, let's say one last more uh, a couple of more questions as well. So there's a question by Courtney that she lives in a, uh, she is saying that I live in a rural area, uh, main USA, and the internet mm -hmm. access uh, the internet speed can be slow or even non-existent at non-existent non-existent at times. Do you think that in current pandemic will help governments to expand uh, access? Yes, so it should be yeah. a utility. It should be a human right, like anything else. The internet is by far the single most important utility for the 21st century. And you should be talking to your mayor, you should be talking to your governor, you should be talking to anybody that you can get access to, to be able to get them to deploy better quality internet. If you look at internet access and um, GDP growth, it is a perfect correlation. And if you look at this globally, it's a perfect correlation. So, I mean, I'm I'm 100% behind that. I actually think governments, if they were very smart, they would provide 
base level free internet to everyone because I think it would be do huge things for the economy. Um, we we had a a situation in um, in the Philippines where we were trying to get people free internet in some of the poorest parts of Manila. And we were stopped at every opportunity simply because the um, the large telecoms were trying to stop us from basically giving out free internet, basically purchasing their pipe and then just redistributing it for free. If it's a public good, if it's a public utility, then it's going to be a lot easier to be able to get it into the hands of people. And um, I know that the U.S. is... It's, it's problematic because in the U.S., I'm Canadian, um, and I have the same problem. There's an oligopoly. So there's only a few companies. So usually there's only like one or two providers inside of a particular market. And that's a big problem. The government, in my opinion, should either make it a public good or should really create a situation in which the government owns the infrastructure and then you have the private industry basically sell that infrastructure directly to the end consumer and therefore creating a lot of competition to be able to drive down prices. Um, depending upon whether you're a socialist or a capitalist, it really, um, it really depends. But yes, everyone should be getting better access to internet. Uh, Courtney, you really need to be able to fight for that because you are going to be left behind inside of this economy if you cannot do zoom calls or you know live storm calls effectively well now that was something very very descriptive and and i can take a lot of things even on a personal level i can learn a lot from that and hope our viewers can too and guys uh, it doesn't really seem like it but uh, it brings us to the end of this wonderful discussion with lion and this was indeed a value-packed session where we touched upon a number of topics and answered a lot of questions on building and growing a team remotely. Although there is a lot more that we could have discussed, unfortunately, we are limited by the paucity of time over here. So I hope you guys love this session. And once again, I would like to thank Liam for taking out time to be a part of this event. Thank you so much, Liam, to take out time over this Yeah, thanks for having schedule. me. And, um, and guys, this is not where it ends. Uh, we have a lot more events lined up for you in the coming days. The next event is uh, marketing and branding strategies for small businesses during COVID-19, which is on 8th May uh, at 12 p.m. on Eastern Daylight Time. So if you guys are interested and haven't registered yet, I am going to put the link of our event section in the chat section where you can find all our up upcoming events and register. So you will receive the link shortly. And guys, please stay abreast with the events right now. And if you are a small business owner and you want your suggestion on what type of events you want, want on our website, you can also follow us on LinkedIn and you will receive the link of the LinkedIn page shortly over there as well. And to watch this session and other such wonderful events, subscribe to our event section on designhill.com events or visit our official YouTube channel, Design Hill. So you can find the link once again in the section as well. You will receive all the links now. And uh, to all the business owners, once again, if you want to source high quality designs, don't forget to visit designhill.com. And there is something which we are doing in the in the current times right now, as uh, a lot of small businesses are dealing with a lot of cash crunch. So we launched a nonprofit initiative right now by the name soslocalbusinesses.com. So how it works is any small startup can put up their sales coupon over there. So the prospective customer can actually pay beforehand and can redeem the coupons later. That's an initiative which we which we try to which are trying you know to make it a little more famous so be more and all of the startups can actually use it. And guys, I'm once again focusing on the fact that it's really not from profit. We are not taking anything out of it, just for you guys. So now we would love if you can be part of the initiative and maybe share it among your circles as well. Sure. It's, yeah, no, it's, that's really uh, great. Uh, yeah, it's completely free of you. Don't have to pay anything. Just create your account and take your business. Very cool. And guys, uh, on that note, I would like to say a goodbye to everyone and a thank you to Liam once again. And to everyone Thanks who joined us, uh, and everyone who joined us, guys, stay safe. And you will receive the copy of this webinar shortly in your inboxes. And uh, yeah, of course, so stay home, stay safe, take care, and happy to go to work in Korea.
Clarmatix is a full service video agency based around video production. We created a brand that fit our identity at the time, but as we've evolved as a company, we found that that original brand didn't quite fit our aspirations anymore. Finding a partner to rebrand your entire company takes a lot of time and effort. Finding Design Hill was an incredible lifeline. Design Hill offers a money back guarantee. If we don't like any of the designs, we get all of our money back. The stuff that we ended up with were well beyond what we had been seeing on other creative services platforms. After creating a simple design brief by answering some questions created by Design Hill, we posted and within a few days, we had over 250 entries. Design Hill's platform made it easy to communicate with all the potential designers. Eventually, we picked a winner. In addition to a logo, our designer also created a letterhead, business cards, and banners for all of our social media platforms. With Design Hill's help, we now have a brand that meets our aspirations. We're ready for the future and everything that it's here to bring.